Hello, I'm Axel Thompson. Today I'm going to talk about how a MIMS microphone works. In 1961, the electric microphone was invented. Um, electric is a material that acts like a capacitor, charge capacitor that is frozen in time and provides a high voltage with a very high output impedance. In the electric microphone, it is placed between to, to bias up the electrode and when the counter electrode moves, the charge that is uh, opposite the charge in the electrode uh, creates a voltage output on this node and that is the voltage that we measure that measures the uh, sound pressure that uh, the microphone converts to a voltage. You can see down below that the circuitry involved is very simple. We use a simple uh, source follow buffer to bring this high impedance signal as to the output. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how this uh, constant charge mode operation uh, works. You can see here the simple equation that links capacitance and the distance of the uh, electrodes and at time zero when there is no signal present we simply give it the subscript of zero. After we go through some basic math we end up with an equation where the output voltage V is proportional to the bias voltage V0 provided by the electric and the uh, ratio of the actual distance at the time uh, divided by the distance at rest at time zero. Now the distance is proportional to the acoustic sound pressure and therefore we get a linear conversion of acoustic sound pressure to voltage. And the circuitry involved um, to generate this voltage is a very simple, very high bias resistor and a voltage source as implemented as the electric. Well, as consumer electronics um, have advanced, the re requirements for the microphone have greatly changed. Today's uh, mo modern products use many microphones, they use very small form factors, um, and uh, as a result, we need to build microphones that are a few millimeters on each side. Um, the smallest microphones available are um, about two cubic millimeters uh, and that um, allows very uh, good integration in consumer products. So what can microphone designers do to meet these size requirements? Well, MEMS allows us to build the structures that we've built in the past in larger dimensions in a very small scale. So actually the uh, structure looks a lot like what we saw in the original 1961 invention. We have a fixed backplate with air holes and a moving membrane and the capacitance between these two parts uh, is what we measure. The only thing we don't have is electric, so we need to replace it with a high voltage source, a charge pump. A little bit more about the physical structure of a MEMS microphone. On the right here we see what a package looks like. You can see the small dimensions. Within these small dimensions is a transducer and a CMOS chip. And the transducer itself from the top looks as such. This is just an, an example, uh, one of many, but the looks of all the competitive parts is pretty similar. What we have here is a moving membrane and you can make out the perforations in the back plate. The back plate is rigid, but uh, allows to let the air flow through. The cross section maybe shows a little more about this structure. We have a diaphragm or a membrane that moves with the acoustic sound pressure. We need a hole in the silicon to allow for the air to move to the diaphragm. And we need a reference plane, that's the back plate, that is perforated so that the air can move through as well. And um, as we um, take our measurement, we take a measurement of the capacitance between the diaphragm 
and the electrodes on the back plate. So the first new element that we need to design for the MEMS microphone is a charge pump. On the scale of the MEMS, there is no electric available. So instead of having a material that serves as a voltage source, we replace it with a charge pump. Um, we start with the supply voltage of maybe 1.8 volts. We need to generate 12 to maybe 20 volts. Um, and um, fortunately, we don't have to provide any load current. This is a high impedance source. The charge pump of choice is a Dixon charge pump as shown below. Uh, the Dixon charge pump is nice in that it uh, does not require any high voltage devices. It does require high voltage capacitors. And um, this drawing here shows a simplified version where the gate drive of the MOSFETs is not really shown. But the overall principle is that, that we take an input voltage and we build up the output voltage by the swing, voltage swing of the clocks, um, phi 1 and phi 2, till we get through a sufficient number of stages the output voltage that we want. So, what does all this physical shrinking uh, of the microphone cost? Well, back in 1961, these numbers were all a lot bigger. Now, we are dealing with transducer capacitance in the picofarad range, an air gap in the micrometer range, um, where one Pascal audio signal moves the membrane by maybe a few nanometer. The noise floor of our measurement of distance has to be in the picometer range. This is incredibly low and accurate. So in terms of capacitance, that means we need to detect a one attofarad change of a capacitance of one picofarad. Just to throw in some example numbers, that would mean a signal size of maybe 12 millivolt, noise floor of 4 microvolts. We have a KT over C noise of a 1 picofarad uh, capacitor that's 64 microvolts. So this is definitely something we will need to address. We can look at the number of electrons on the transducer, and that's just 75 million electrons. So the point I'm trying to make here, that is, this is a very difficult environment to take a measurement because all the signals are of high impedance and very weak, and we have to be very careful. Additionally, with such a small capacitance, the parasitic capacitance cannot be neglected. It can be in the order of 20% of the transducer capacitance. So let's talk about the noise. The KTOC noise is the integral of the resistor noise on a capacitor between DC and infinity. As I said, the KT over C noise of one picofarad is too high. So, but if the resistance is large, most of the KT over C noise ends up below the audio band. The resistance must be in the order of a terohm, 10 to the 12 ohm, one picoamp per volt. So, this, of course, is very difficult. The solutions that people use are reverse bias diest, long channel MOSFETs in the off state, and uh, similar turned off devices. We can provide such an impedance, but often it's not very well controlled, and we have to balance leakage and impedance at uh, low temperature. This shows graphically what has to happen with the uh, with the noise from the bias resistor. If we look at the noise at this node here in the middle, um, we can see the noise um, spectrum on this uh, graph. So the higher we make the uh, um, bias resistor, the higher noise floor we get, but also the lower bandwidth. And when we look only in the audio band and not the integral from DC to infinity, we can see that with a higher R bias, we get lower contribution from this bias resistor in the audio band. So, as stated before, this leads to very high um, resistor requirements. Let's talk next about parasitic capacitors. Constant charge mode operation is a linear operation, but that's under the assumption that there is no parasitic capacitance present at this node V1. 
the parasitic capacitance makes the transfer from distance to voltage nonlinear because instead of a constant charge across the CMIMS, some of the charge escapes into C pair. And as you see in the equations on the right, the presence of C pair results in a significant nonlinearity of the uh, signal. The obvious solution well known is to use bootstrapping. Bootstrapping basically means that we use the buffered signal to drive the backside of the parasitic capacitance and essentially make it look like it is not present because the voltage on the left side and on the right side of this capacitor is identical. So this definitely solves the uh, distortion problem. Um, because no charge escapes into C para, but there is a noise penalty associated with this due to the signal attenuation. The noise of this amplifier appears amplified here and the uh, amplification factor ends up being one plus the ratio of the parasitic capacitance to the MEMS capacitance. The next big challenge is flicker noise. So we talk about very high resistances here and um, therefore we're facing a challenge. Uh, the input device here presents flicker noise in the audio band and um, this could be a significant part of our noise contribution. Many techniques are known to remove flicker noise from an amplifier circuits such as auto zero and chopping but unfortunately, um, those techniques have input currents into the amplifier larger than a picoamp. So they cannot be used. Any kind of current that goes into the amplifier circuit will have to pass through this very large resistor and um, one picoamp exceeds a budget. So therefore, for flicker noise, all we can do is use a brute force solution of large input devices with, unfortunately, a large gate capacitance that has to be smaller than transducer capacitance. This is where the design is in a very tight box. So this brings us to new developments that are necessary to push the performance of microphones further. The requirements of smaller form factor, lower noise, higher acoustic overload point, meaning the uh, maximum input signal, come from the uh, customers. Different readout schemes are possible, such as charge integration, um, different transducers, such as the recently presented differential transducer that's shown in the graph here on the right, where we have um, larger signal generation and uh, less distortion problems due to the presence of a fully differential signal path, integrated processes that reduce parasitic capacitances between uh, at the uh, output node of the microphone, digital microphones that uh, deliver a digital output to the, uh, uh, from the IC, and maybe different readout techniques such as piezoelectric um, readout of displacement, optical readout of displacement, and maybe going forward, even closed loop systems that can uh, improve the performance of the microphone. So as a conclusion, not much has fundamentally changed in the microphone since 1961, but the shrinking sizes have brought out the classic problems of MEMS, tiny signals from high impedances that produce challenging conditions. So new approaches are needed to push the performance envelope.